The views expressed on this program are those of the producers and individuals appearing on this program and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Sun Prairie Media Center staff, its video service providers, or the staff and elected officials of the City of Sun Prairie. Hello and welcome to Real Reviews. My name is Jameson Rabbit, and this week I'm so excited to be joined by, you know him, you love him, he's the award-winning host of Sun Prairie News, and one of the finest actors in this town, it's Dan <laughs> Presser. Well, it's been a minute since I've been here, and I've never been defined as that. In fact, I've been defined as the opposite of that <laughs> before, but thank you anyway for yes, that. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's so I'm so happy to have you back. It's been forever, it feels like. I think maybe it was the last time you were here. Were we looking ahead at this year of movies? I think that is the last wow, time. that was a while ago. And I don't think any of the movies on today's list no. made that. They're not going to make the best of list at the end of the no. year. Spoiler alert. No. Rough week. But a lot of stars in these movies. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of them, including one big couple have a... Uh, uh, two competing movies out this week. Oh. The Benefer. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I forgot about that. I didn't get to see the one, but that's I all saw right. Jennifer's. That's so. all right. Yeah. Let's get into what we do have, though, with this week's uh, On the Marquee. And I'm going to start us off, sir. We have a film called Fool's Paradise. This is from Charlie Day. He wrote, directed, and starred in this film. You know him from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, probably. Um He's the star of this film. Uh, we meet him, just as you see here in the trailer. We meet him. He's, he's a man in a mental hospital. The doctors let us know right away that he's got the mind of a child, the intellect of a Labrador. Uh, he does not talk. It's not that he can't talk. He just doesn't talk. Uh, he smiles blankly. Despite all this and all his problems, he's getting kicked out onto the street, uh, just as we saw, because he can't pay. Uh, he lands in Hollywood, uh, and this is a Hollywood that's set in the modern day, but has all the trappings of old school classic Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And this man is not so subtly thrust on us in this Charlie Chaplin type role as a guy who doesn't talk. Uh, we see him, he's out selling oranges out on the street, and a high strung film producer played by Ray Lio the, the great late Ray Liotta in his final performance. Um, he is a producer who is dealing with the petulant star of his Billy the Kid film uh, spots this guy in the street and catches his eye because he is the spitting image of the famous actor who is starring in Billy the Kid, who is insufferable and unwilling to come out of his trailer. So Ray Liotta grabs him and throws him onto the set of this film filled with method actors led by a guy named Chad Lux, who's playing Black Bart. He is played in this film by Adrian Brody. He's a method actor who's not very good as an actor, but he's very committed to the method, even though the results aren't necessarily great. Something good to react to, though. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and paired with Christiana Dior, who's the big starlet, who's played by Kate Beckinsale in here. We also have the, the, the competing story in this is uh, a guy named Lenny. He's a publicist played by Ken Jeong. He's out of work. He's a publicist in name only since he doesn't have any clients. Uh, and he latches onto this mute guy who he calls Latte Pronto through a uh, confusion as Ray Liotta's character yells, Latte Pronto. And he's like, it must be his name. Uh, and he's, he's going to ride this guy to the top. And he does for a while and in classic Hollywood fashion. He rides this guy all the way to the top and uh, Hollywood falls in love with this actor who is who's they, they deem brilliant because of his un unconventional acting style of not saying anything looking directly into the camera right he doesn't say anything like he's and, a genius and nobody knows what he's thinking right. later in the movie one of the many stars in this movie John Malkovich yeah yeah basically <laughs> says that kind of revealing the whole you know the whole secret of the movie yeah. is that you know people think he's a genius they don't really know how to take the guy yeah. and, it, and it's very it's kind of interesting I kind of I saw this movie as um, uh, being there meets the little tramp you know only yeah I think that yeah I think that was very purposeful too yeah and those two movies are just impossible to remake and and to match in you know it, it, it's the classic tale of the shooting star that has to come back to earth and kind of a satirical take on Hollywood and how they've fallen over somebody right. and and the, the sycophants and the leeches, especially Ken Jeong's character. Yeah. It's like, oh, anyone that can give me any work. He's and so good at that the, he, frenetic the character. The desperation yeah. in his character is yes. palpable. Yes. So is. many of these people are uh, palpable desperation. 
And the constant refrain that comes to this movie is, I'm a somebody. Mm-hmm. You're right. a somebody. Right. We're not nobodies. It's, it's what everybody in this Hollywood, of course, is striving for, is yeah. to be somebody. And the only one who really is somebody is Charlie Day's character. Right. Latte Pronto. Latte Pronto, that's right. I was very excited. I like Charlie Day a lot. Um, and one of the things that I love about Charlie Day is his comedic voice. Mm-hmm. So what's the one thing you take away from him in this movie? His comedic voice. Right. And that wore on me after a while. Like, man, you really hamstrung him. I get the Chaplin reference and all this, but yeah. after a while, it's like you could, they filled this movie full of star cameos. Oh, Tons boy. of star cameos. It, it was just loaded. I mean, that's the theme of today, right? Stars in movies. And yeah. You can, in this, I mean, stars get movies made, and movies draw stars to them. And this, obviously, Charlie Day has lots of friends in the business yeah. who helped him out with this movie. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like I'd seen a be- much better version of this movie. You mentioned a couple. Also, it reminded me a lot of Bowfinger. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yes. Right. Bowfinger was brilliantly done with right. two great actors, Eddie Murphy, Steve Martin. Mm-hmm. Really enjoyed that. Um, and I don't know. It's, it's part of it just it started to we- just wear on me, just bother me of like, this could be so much better. Yeah. There's so many things in here. I, it wants to be really wry about it. it's taking shots at Hollywood, but I just didn't think it was smart enough. I don't know. No, I agree. And, you know, there were things I really liked about, you know, as you mentioned, Charlie Day really doesn't use his voice at all, but the guy has great facial ex- oh, yeah. facial expression, and he can really do a lot with just a small expression. So that's kind of fun to watch. And there's some great cameos in this. You know, Jason Sudeikis has some some great lines as a you know a self-absorbed director. So yeah. there were some really, really fun moments. And John Malkovich, as I me- mentioned before. I loved it. He was, and it just ended there. It Malkovich just ended. gives a big monologue, basically. And then, it's like, and then suddenly he wakes up somewhere else. It yeah. was That was weird to me. It was like he was one of the Koch brothers, basically like yeah. this Koch brother type character yeah. and so that was very strange and honestly one of the other really fun roles for me in this was common as the oh dagger. yeah 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 suddenly i like that part quite a bit that was probably to me one of the best parts of the movie because it showed how close sanity and insanity yes. are especially <laughs> in a place like hollywood and the, yeah i did like that i found myself man i was i watched this with my son i found myself at points going kind of bored in here. Yeah, is it over yet? Yeah, yeah, I was. I was very bored. So when, when Common shows up a Dagger, kind of brightens things up, mm-hmm. brings a new energy to it all. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. I was a little let down by it. I had high hopes for Charlie Day. Yeah, I agree. In his first time to really, this is your vision, this is your movie, here's some, here's some money, here's a ton of stars. It's kind of like it, I mean, it meandered and at some, which was intentional, I think, but at some point it was kind of like, get to the point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly how I felt. Uh, all right, what did you end up giving uh, Fool's Paradise, sir? I believe I gave it two and a half stars mm-hmm. because I I really, you know, I like a lot of the people in this movie. And like you, I had high expectations for, for Charlie Day in his debut as a director-writer. So, um, But I enjoyed parts overall. It's something you could wait for. Yeah, I ended up giving it two stars, I think. Yeah, two stars. Yeah, I was just, I don't know, let down by it. Like, there's some, there's some parts that we talked about that were entertaining, but this is definitely a... Wait and see. Yeah. For sure. Well, uh, go, let's go ahead and move into the next movie we have on the marquee. This is, uh, I had to get caught up. I had not seen the first movie, so I had to rewatch, I had to watch the first one to get caught up on the the, uh, all, all the book backstory. club cinematic universe. Oh, yeah. Well, I have to admit, I did not see the first one either. You're okay. And uh, I may wish that I hadn't seen this one <laughs> What do we got? Well, uh, Book Club, the next chapter, it's directed by Bill Holderman. He returned to direct this one. He directed the last one. And the Book Club is back, but there's no real specific book that they are revolving around. Like the last one, I believe, was uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. Yes, absolutely. And a lot of, I'm sure, sexual innuendo oh, and, yeah. and older women, you know, jokes about that. Well, this time, it's an upcoming wedding and a long-forgotten trip to Italy that inspires them. And their plan is to drink wine, sightsee, and enjoy each other's company. Along the way, of course, there's some twists and turns. The ladies get arrested twice, at least twice, by the same police officer. Mm -hmm. And um, he's very incompetent. And there's some secrets that are revealed. And, of course, there's the obligatory wedding dress fitting scene with uh, the older women um, 
enjoying their time, their wine, and all of their different types of uh, dresses that they try on. And there's a bit of a surprise at the end, which I'm not going to tell you about, mm -hmm. uh, and I can't spoil that for you. So, oh, <laughs> no, be careful. Of course, this <laughs> is a star vehicle. You've got, you, you know, you've got Diane Keaton, you've got Jane Fonda, uh, Mary Steenburgen, and Candace Bergen, mm -hmm. all just, you know, people who most of us have loved to watch over the years sure. in their various roles, and really, they play the roles that you expect them to play in, in these movies. You know, you've got Diane Keaton, who basically, she's even called Diane, yeah. and it's pretty much she's playing Diane Keaton as it's kind we of the know wet Diane blanket Keaton. out of the group. She kind of is. Um, but, you know, they bring out this dress at the wedding thing, and it's just it like... It couldn't have been more Diane Keaton. It was Diane Keaton. Hat it's like all. She could have worn that in. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, that that's kind of fun, and I, I've always had a kind of a soft spot for Candace Bergen. I, I really, she kind of shined for me in this, mm -hmm. uh, out of all the characters. And um, they're, they're, they're male friends, Don Johnson, Andy Garcia, Craig T. Nelson. Mm -hmm. I would have liked to have seen more of them, especially so Craig T. Nelson. if you watch the first movie, yeah. it's a lot more than this one. They were basically written out of the movie, just like, we'll cut oh. to them on a phone call every, every once in a while. Yeah, and that was kind of disappointing because yeah. I, I really, especially Craig T. Nelson and Andy Garcia, I, yeah. I really love those guys. Um, it might have been a better uh, film for me, really, if they would have just let those four ladies just go at it. Just go at, you know, send them, send them loose in Italy. The script wasn't really all that exciting. There wasn't really a there story really to it. There wasn't a story. It's it was kind like of a, a travelogue. Planes, trains, and automobiles, light. Yes. Um, also, I'm wondering how the same police chief arrests them in various cities around Italy. Well, that's what I was wondering too. Like, like he gets does he here, just travel gets around? Venice, and then, like, everywhere they go, like, yeah, I got you again. And, and I can't remember what that actor's name is, oh, but yeah. it was kind of like Giancarlo really, Giannini. That's it. Not really a dignified role for him. He's yeah. he's a pretty good actor. And, yeah, and, he's a that guy. Yeah, I know yeah, that guy. I know him. Um, so I guess, but you know what? I was in the movie uh, in the in the theater it's and. A movie. Yeah, I wasn't in the movie. I was in the theater, uh -huh. um, and there was a lot of, uh, I'll say I'm proud, I think I was the only man in the theater, and the women who were in there were having a good time and laughing at it, so I'm clearly not the audience for this movie. <laughs> yeah. um, so people enjoyed it. There were some funny moments, uh, but overall I didn't think the writing really held up, and I, I think they probably would have had more fun if they just ad-libbed the whole thing. Well, that's the thing. is like The first one is about the book club. Yeah. And Fifty Shades and a lot of bondage jokes and stuff. This one, the book club, is nothing. They mentioned the Alchemist a couple of times, but really yeah. the book part, portion of this is yeah. thrown aside. It's a bachelorette party. Um, and there's just not a lot of there there in this movie. Like, right. It's just the jokes are thin. The plot is even thinner than that. Um, I enjoyed Candace Bergen a lot. I thought she was given the most to do. Yeah, I agree. I thought her character was kind of well-rounded. But the rest of the cast, I felt like they didn't give them a whole lot to do. No. Um you know, and, and we've seen a lot of these movies. Like Jane Fonda was in one similar to this earlier this year, 80 for Brady. Right. I enjoyed that movie. I was very surprised how much I enjoyed yeah, that, that movie. Yeah, that kind of exceeded your expectations. Yeah, it did. And, right. you know, it, this is just kind of, this is, you know, friends going out, finding life and love and whatever. But it just, after a while, I'm like, well, nothing really matters in this movie. And the, the men are written out of it, basically. Um, and, it, you know, it also left me at the end asking myself, can American perform a legal ceremony in another country? Oh, that's a great I don't know question. If that's even possible. I mean, there was a lot of questions. A lot of, I mean, and like even some recycled jokes that I saw in 80 for Brady. 80 for Brady, Sally Field had a running joke about her fanny pack. And instantly we get fanny pack jokes in this. I was like, oh man, we're just retreading. <laughs> same, very same familiar jokes. territory. Yeah, I don't know. I, it's just, a, it felt to me like a series of occurrences as opposed to yeah. a coherent story for well, me. It felt like to me, like, uh, you know, so many movies were made during the pandemic. Um, that just never felt complete. Mm -hmm. And this one, I mean, they started in the pandemic, right. they're doing Zoom calls, and there's kind of a lot of stuff that's really not funny anymore because we kind of been there, done that with Zoom calls. Mm -hmm. So it felt it felt like it just never hit the mark for me and that they kind of made it hurriedly and got it done. Yeah, I actually, I, I watched the original, I hadn't seen it when it came out. I enjoyed it enough. Yeah. Eh, middle of the road, you know, for me. Um, but I, I like this cast, so I, Same. Have, I like all these ladies. Um, this movie felt like it was the bucket list with without the ticking clock. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, we've always wanted to go to Italy. We've always wanted to do this. It's yeah. like, yeah, but nobody's dying, so we're right. <laughs> good. Um, 
So and the final think? act of this movie was really cringy to me. Uh, yeah, I that's just what, hated uh, the final act of this. I don't know. I kind of expected it, though. Yeah, you, well, I knew right. it was coming. Um, the only thing I really liked about this was there's one moment in the film where the film kind of stops down and the ladies all start getting brutally honest with each other. Like, I'm going to tell you what I think of you. And I really like that. Like, we're best friends. Right. We're, it's time for us all to share. And I like that moment. Like, okay, this is this is nice. Until that moment, they really didn't have a lot to say to each other. <laughs> exactly. They just kind of hung out drinking. Nobody's going to call her out on that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What did you end up giving uh, Book Club the next chapter? So I gave it a two, and mm-hmm. simply because I, I like the stars in this movie, and, you know, it was enjoyable enough. But, again, not high art. Yeah. I concur. I gave it two stars as well. Um, I think I would have given the first one two and a half. Okay. Uh, so it's no, no great shakes, but, uh, and again, we are not the ideal audience. No. When I went and no. saw it, I went by myself. It was me and several 70-year-old couples in there. They right. were enjoying it. They were having a good time. Exactly. God bless you. Have fun. Just wasn't for me. Same. Uh, all right, the last movie we have on the marquee is a film that I went and saw. It is the new film from director Robert Rodriguez, stars Ben Affleck. It's a film called Hypnotic. Uh, Ben Affleck stars as a detective, Danny Rourke. Uh, Danny Rourke is a detective who's struggling with the trauma of his daughter's abduction, which happened right in front of him. We're seeing it on the screen right now. And it's all-consuming. The man who abducted her claims that he has no memory of it. And in his duty, Detective Rourke tracks a man who uh, is pulling off a bank heist. This man is played by William Fickner. His name is Del Rain. Uh, He's pulling off this bank heist without ever actually getting his hands dirty. He gets the security guards and the teller to do all the work for him. And they're watching, they're trying to figure out how he's doing this. He does it simply by saying some words to them. And these people do his dirty work. He also, they discover, Del Rain has a clue to Rourke's daughter and her disappearance. But even more strange than all this, he seems to be able to turn anyone against Rourke just by saying some wo- some words. And so uh, he, he's chasing, as, as Rourke is chasing this guy around, he leads him to this strip mall where he, he meets up with this fortune teller. She's got answers and uh, warnings. She's a lady, uh, Diana Cruz, played by Alice Braga. She's got warnings for him, but she explains to him that there are hypnotics in the world who have powers to control minds. They can influence and reshape minds and then activate them with a simple phrase. And she also reveals that she is also one of them. And she worked together with Del Rain in a dark government program years ago. And he's a hypnotic and he's basically a supervillain who who has uses hypnosis to create pawns to do his crimes. He's he, they, they basically explain him as the Babe Ruth of hypnotics. Hmm. Uh, and uh, he can turn anyone into a drone, a zombie. And he basically has endless weapons then because he can basically just by looking at someone and saying words, he can turn them into. And so he's just armies wow. of That's regular great people power. coming out. Yeah, right? <laughs> and most of these pawns also have a kill switch in them where uh, they ultimately end up committing suicide. Uh, but why is he after Detective Rourke? How is his daughter connected to all this? This is the great mystery in this movie that you would hope is getting solved. Um, and it's kind of an interesting mystery for the first half of this movie and his motivation. I'm trying to figure it out. There's a lot of red herrings. Nothing is as what it seems. Uh, and then when he starts, we start to find out that this Del Ring guy can warp reality. And it leads to it, some Inception-like scenes where suddenly the surround the buildings are warping over oh. you. And, and it's done really poorly. Huh. Um, <laughs> it doesn't okay. really work. So it's not like Inception. No, no. It's just like, oh, let's try and do an Inception thing, only let's not like really put the effort into it. Because until then, it sounded like kind of an interesting concept. That's right. And the first, like, like first... 40 minutes of the movie, like, oh, this is really interesting. And then the payoff really drops the ball. There's a huge plot twist I'm not going to tell you about in the third act. Uh, and the facts that we've been given throughout the entire movie start to change. Everything is unreliable. You don't know what to trust, what to believe. Hmm. Nothing really matters. Some things make more sense with the plot twist. A lot of things make less sense So do you it. feel ripped off a little bit then? Kind of. Yeah, okay. I felt myself, I was found myself really engaged in the mystery uh, and kind of guessing on where it was going. And I was even in my notes, I'm writing, like, predictions. Oh, I bet it's going to go here. Uh, you know, and the idea of being able to turn people into drones for your bidding is kind of interesting. And William Fickner is a great guy for this role as a villain. He's yeah. just a great character actor, villain guy in everything yeah. he does. Well developed in this, it sounds like. And uh, yeah, it just it really let me let me down at the end. And then it left it open at the end when it's you thought everything was resolved. And they're like, I actually went. Even the resolution, uh, don't trust that either. 
Huh. And I walked out of there going, this is this is rough. So uh, how about Affleck? Affleck was good in this, but it's weird. This is Robert Rodriguez, who's a big-time director, mm-hmm. and Ben Affleck. And this movie is barely in any theaters, didn't get any publicity, and is a massive box office bomb. Made no money over the weekend. And oh. like these are two bankable stars. They should do better. Uh, Robert Rodriguez used to be relevant back when he was making, you know, all of the, the Antonio Banderas films yeah. and all that. Um I think this movie, I see it having a decent run streaming okay. because of Affleck, and it has an interesting premise, and it looks cool. Um, but, yeah, like halfway through the movie, I go, this could be a pretty good movie. This might, this might be the one this week that really gets me. And at the end, I was, I was left like, with a bitter taste in my mouth. So why do you think they don't release that right into streaming when it almost seems like that's the plan? Yeah, I don't know because I think it should have been because really it's not playing in a lot of theaters. They put a lot of money into it. They had to know they're not going to recoup it. Right. uh, Yeah, I I don't know. It's weird. It's weird to have a Ben Affleck movie that just kind of slips into theaters and will be gone in a week. Yeah, one of the bigger stars on the face of the planet right yeah, now. It really. was, uh, yeah, it was very strange to me. Uh, so I ended up giving this one, just like I've, all the movies so far this week, two stars again. Everything's a two-star it's movie. It's a two-star day. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a little frustrating, but I guess out of the three two-star movies, this was the most interesting, at least, to me. Okay. Uh, just the payoff was uh, unacceptable in my book. Well, then I might <laughs> just not watch this one until it gets to That's streaming. That's totally fine. Yep. Speaking of streaming, yeah. uh, Ben Affleck, uh, he and his wife, Jennifer Lopez, uh, had a great Mother's Day weekend of movies coming out against each other. Right. The other half, Jennifer Lopez, makes a movie that kind of sounds like it was the opposite <laughs> of what you just talked about. Again, kind of a revenge, I've got to get my daughter type of a movie. Mm-hmm. So they're both kind of going out there trying to save their daughters. Yeah, or absolutely. Uh, and, and this one is directed by Nico Caro. Uh, and it stars Jennifer Lopez, Lucy Pays as her daughter. It's called The Mother, by the Zoe, way. What did I call it? No, you didn't. Oh, I didn't call it. It's The Mother. <laughs> she's The Mother. I don't even know if you know her name other than she's the mother in this movie. And then uh, Yeah, no, she's listed as The as Mother. As The Mother. So Lucy Pays <laughs> as her daughter, Zoe. Omari Hardwick is an FBI agent who's her friend, William. Um, and Joseph Fiennes and Gail Garcia Bernal as the bad guys. Yeah. I think one's named Hector and the other one. I can't try Adrian. to Adrian. Adrian is the other one. I see the names kind of slip. Yeah. Slip by me. <laughs> you know, this is a story of a battle-scarred Afghan war veteran. She's on the run from an ex-lover or lovers after she's placed in hiding in Alaska. But before that happens, we meet her when she's an informant running from the bad guys 12 years earlier. Mm-hmm. At the time, she's pregnant with one of the bad guys' babies, either Hector or Adrian. Who knows? We think. But the FBI isn't ready for them when they're questioning her and getting information from her, and they catch up to her with one of them trying to kill. Was that, I think, was that Hector who tried to kill her, or was I it Adrian? I think so. Okay. They are so similar. Yeah, one of them tried to kill her baby by stabbing her in the womb. Fortunately, the baby lives, and Lopez's character has to make the tough decision to give the baby up for adoption. The FBI says we're taking your baby. Yeah, basically. <laughs> okay, you're right. They said, you've signed off on the paperwork already. We're going to give your baby. And she basically resolves herself to the fact that her child is going to have a much more normal life with mm-hmm. another family. And she goes into hiding in Alaska, where she, of course... It felt a little like Rocky IV, where yes. she's, she's out in the, she's in Alaska, and she's killing elk and whatever else there is to eat, and yeah. you know she becomes a real outdoors person there. And then they come to find her. One of her, I, I don't even know what the character's name was, comes and tells her it's time she has to go back because her daughter's in trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, and and honestly, that whole first half of the movie just took way too long for yeah. me. It it I think it was, I think until she had her daughter in her hands was probably more than half of the movie. Yeah, I think you're right. And and I felt like you, at least for me, I didn't care enough about what she was doing until she got to that relationship with her daughter. And her daughter was uh, a wonderful character, I thought, and she really did a nice job. And their relationship was when the movie, to me, started to move. So that first half, I mean, there's a lot of action. There's a lot of, like, James Bond light scenes. You know, they're in Cuba running through the streets yeah. uh, or driving through the streets, killing people, hitting people. She has this sniper moment because she's a ex-sniper. Oh, she's, like, 
America's greatest weapon. She is. She's she's crazy talented. You had forty confirmed kills, two right. tours in Iraq. Right, and and she did something that I think no sniper would ever do: start shooting at bad guys in, in a, a park, playground, park filled <laughs> yeah. with kids. So probably not really something you'd see in a real world scenario, but. You know, there was a lot of action, but until she got her daughter, and I, I don't want to tell you what actually happens, and that relationship s- starts to develop, the movie really didn't feel all that interesting to me. But yeah. then it got interesting, I thought. I had some problems specifically with Jennifer Lopez in this movie. I didn't think she was believable in this. First off, the fact that she's able to basically outmuscle everyone she comes across. Yeah. She's just beating everyone up left and right. Yeah. All right. Um, but she, they, the director, Nikki Carroll, it felt like her direction was be emotionless. You can't have any emotions. Agreed. And yep. I'm like, come on. Like, she's playing it like a robot for a large chunk of this movie. And it made me really bored with her character. Of, like, mm-hmm. you're just so super serious. You know, and I thought that this movie, this premise of, okay, the FBI's going to take your baby. And all the bad guys are coming after you. Like, okay, we should play this a little more tongue in cheek almost. Like, I don't know. With, with Jennifer Lopez, I just didn't believe her in the role. And so that. Part of me kind of went into that. And like you said, the first half of the movie, I'm like, I can't get any traction with this character or the movie or right. anything. And then like, yeah, I don't see her like beating up like a whole room full of guys like that. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I struggled to stay engaged in this movie. You know, and I I like that J-Lo is willing to dip her toe into the badass action star role. I, I like that. Go I actually kind of liked her in that, but I, I agree with you, I think. She had one expression throughout most of the movie. Yeah. And, and like I said, I, I felt like her acting came out more when she was developing that relationship with her daughter later in the movie. I also, I have a one pet peeve, and it came out in this movie, and it came out in Hypnotic as well, uh, for bad movies that that characters give, there's too much exposition given through two characters having a conversation that is just yeah. a, a dialogue of like, as she's explaining her past, she's like, I did this, and, th- and her partner's like, yeah, and then you did that, and you, know, you, did, and you did that, and you're telling each other. He's like, no one talks, no one, has, no one talks no one like talk, that. Filling in the it's blanks. Just giving exposition of a back- and background. And then remember when I met you. And yeah, we did, and then, yeah. yeah, and then you did this. Yeah. Yeah, no one talks <laughs> like that, but it's just a lazy writing style. It drives me nuts. Uh, I agree. Uh, you know, I, I think the other thing about this movie that, that bothered me a lot was that... Um, you know what's going to happen. Basically, you know she's not going to die. You know, um, I, I guess, spoiler alert. Oh, jeez, come uh, on. <laughs> I just ruined it for you. And, and you you know what's going to happen in the end, basically. Yeah. So I, I guess that's expected. But sometimes you want a little bit of a twist yeah. in there. And also, the the bad guy characters, I just call them the bad guys because they were so poorly developed. Yeah, exactly. You, you don't they're even changeable. You, I don't know. You don't even know really why they're bad guys no. other than they're, they're just chasing, chasing, after chasing her. her. They're grabbing a kid. So, yeah. of course, they're bad. They're kidnapping, which is a bad thing. It's but, like, thing. what's their crime background? Yeah. We don't know any of that. Exactly. So, yeah. very one dimensional, maybe two dimensional characters. What did you end up giving the mother? Well, I gave it a little higher than you. I'm a, uh, I gave it a three, I believe. Oh, we are way um, apart. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, I started at two and a half, but I gave it a three because I think I enjoyed um, the daughter's performance better than Jennifer Lopez's, mm-hmm. and I liked that relationship a little bit. I, I kind of That drew me in more. So it was the opposite of, of your uh, Ben Affleck movie. <laughs> I really didn't like this movie. Yeah. <laughs> I gave this movie a half a star. Wow. I was really out on this film. And I felt like this was the worst slate of movies that I've had all year long. This felt like a January release week, yeah, not a mid-May well, in Mother's Ameri- Day weekend release week. America apparently disagrees with you on that because apparently this is like one of the Netflix best openings awesome. for this movie. Love and, it. you know, good for them. Good for them. Good right. for J-Lo. Yeah, I don't know. I don't recommend it. Star, liked it. star power. There you yeah. go. All right, let's take a look ahead at what is coming soon the weekend of May 26th. There's a ton of movies in the theater that weekend. Uh, I'm going to run through these. We have a film called Kandahar. Gerard Butler stars as a CIA operative who must flee with his translator from Afghanistan amongst, amidst mounting trouble. I just saw a Jake Gyllenhaal movie that was exactly like this. Uh, we also have About My Father. Sebastian Maniscalco stars as a man whose old school Italian father cra- crashes his son's engagement weekend with the future in-laws, causing a lot of embarrassment. Uh, stars Robert De Niro as the father in the title. Uh, we have Julie Louis-Dreyfus in You Hurt My Feelings, a comedy about an author who overhears her husband dogging her re- latest book, and that her, that reaction might doom their marriage. Uh, we have The Machine, starring comedian Burt Kreischer as Burt Kreischer, the ultimate party animal, a.k.a. The Machine, 
who finds himself and his father, who's played by Mark Hamill, kidnapped by some Russians. It's based on a true story. Looks wild. And then lastly, of course, Disney's The Little Mermaid, the final, uh, the newest uh, live action treatment for the Disney franchise films. All that's coming out the weekend of May 26th. Before we go any further, thank you to Marcus Theaters, our sponsor for this program. We do appreciate the Palace being our sponsor each and every week. Next week, I'm going to be talking about films like Fast X, Master Gardener, White Men Can't Jump, Land of Gold, and I'm going to have Jeff Robbins sitting right there talking about all these. That sounds like a better week. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, thank you again for joining me, sir. Happy to be here. Thanks for asking me. Tune into the Sun Prairie News to find to check out the best program here on KSUN. Next to this his. This guy hosts it. It's next great. to Real Reviews. I don't yes. know about that. All right. Until next week, though, I'm Jameson. And I'm Dan. Thanks for watching.